inviting me to give this talk. Um, I'm going to talk about H. pylori. We're switching gear a little bit about some things happening in the stomach. So all this is kind of more developed than what you previously heard about bacteria in the small bowel or in the colon. So feel free to put your pen down. You don't need to take any pictures. Everything I talk about today will be on the internet and Wikipedia, PubMed. So, but it's a very interesting story, and I really want to spend a few minutes to go over it because we're in Hollywood, and this is honestly a story that is waiting for a screenplay, and I'll tell you why. All right. So, you know, people have been getting stomach pains, you know, feeling full after eatings, maybe having bleeding afterwards for like thousands and thousands of years, okay? And from 50,000 BC to 1984, people thought it was like IBS. Uh, you literally had people saying, Oh, you have stomach pain because you're stressed, you're smoking, you're high risk, high stress job. You know, it's not an organic condition. And so the marketplace, just like IBS, was filled with these, you know, snake oil kind of like treatments. And so this is one ad for like a treatment for stomach ulcers. And there were spas all throughout North America and Europe where they would offer to relax you and help you treat your stomach ulcers and your stomach pain. And this was all legitimate. It was not a science that people were interested in. They thought this was all in your head. Kind of like what Dr. Pimentel described about IBS. But of course, now we know this is not true. And how we got there was very recent, we about the 1980s when this happened. And this was all due to two men uh, pictured here. Uh, on the left is uh, Barry Marshall, and on the right is Robin Warrens, and they're both Australian. They're very different people from my understanding. So the person on the right is a pathologist. He's older, he's established. He was a staff uh, pathologist in a hospital in Australia. While the man on the left, Barry Marshall, was, um, he was basically just out of medical school. He was like a new resident who was assigned to do a research project uh, as part of his training. And so around that time, you know, um, gastroenterologists began doing endoscopy. They were taking samples of stomach tissues in patients with stomach pain and bleeding and to look under the microscope. And around that time, they were also developing techniques to kind of look at the different bacteria um, that were visible in these samples. And uh, Robin Warren began noticing that a lot of patients with stomach ulcers had these uh, curvy, spirochy kind of bacteria uh, in them. And majority of patients with ulcer had these uh, bacteria. He wasn't the first one to notice this, to be honest. Looking back, people have noticed this as well. But he was the first one to thought, I think this is why patients have ulcers. Of course, no one believed them, because remember when I told you, people thought this was a stress thing, and no one thought it was an organic cause related to their symptom. So. Uh, Barry Marshall was advised to talk to uh, uh, Dr. Warren and start a project in this area. And so two of them looked, uh, basically did a database of patients with ulcers and found that the majority of them had this bacteria, H. pylori, in their stomach samples. They even, proved, they even showed that if you can eradicate these bacteria, it seemed to improve their symptoms. But then again, no one believed them. So what did it take to finally get the medical um, science to believe that this was the cause of the bacteria, of the ulcers? Well, that's when Barry Marshall had his kind of Nobel Prize winning idea, or the gambit. And this is forever immortalized in this comic strip. trip. Apparently, it's in the Nobel Prize Museum. So essentially, um, he did a scope on a patient with ulcers, saw the bacteria, grew the bacteria, and then drank it himself. And sure enough, 10 days later, he had developed stomach upsets, and he had a scope, and they found the same bacteria, same ulcers. And this is a picture of the microbiologist who grew it, apparently. And this was his real-time reaction. The funny thing is that he said in an interview later on that he told his wife what he did. And his wife was just livid. And she said, don't give it to me and my kids. <laughs> But he persisted, and 10 days later, you know, they had a scope and proved that you know, this, previously he was healthy. He took this bacteria and then had developed ulcers, kind of like a, a causality um, effect. And this eventually won both of them the Nobel Prize in 2005. Um, no movies yet, I've checked. 
Uh, I actually went to a lecture given by Barry Marshall in Toronto uh, when I was a PhD student. Uh, I didn't get to meet him personally, but my colleague said he did wear his uh, Nobel Prize uh, medal <laughs> around his neck, and they, he did show it off to them in the elevator at SickKids uh, <laughs> after the talk. Uh, but apparently he's a very interesting guy. So now that we kind of talked about the fun part, let's kind of get to the, some of the facts we now know about H. pylori. And we do know a lot about H. pylori. Uh, we know it's been affecting humans for at least 50,000 years. And the most astounding fact if you look on Wikipedia is that it's probably present in about 50% of the population in the world. It's more common definitely in certain countries and in certain places, depending on the socioeconomic status of the environment. And we know that in the last you know, 10 years, the rates have gone down slightly, probably about 40%, because we've been treating it a lot more. Um, and hygiene and, standards, cleaning and uh, health standard has gone up. But it's still really common uh, infection in human. So how, is it, how do you get it? Well, this is actually the part that we don't really understand completely. We do know that you, know, you can, and I emphasize can, get it from kissing, sharing utensils, drinking contaminated water, having poor hygiene, living in crowded conditions, and oftentimes uh, from your own family, from kind of vertical transmissions, or from parents to uh, children. Yet, this is not like infectious gastroenteritis. It's not like you just go someplace, you drink some contaminated water, you get it. It's actually really hard to get as an adult. And we've actually, not we, but like the medical community have studied this extensively. And we now know that probably over 90% of H. pylori infection occurs in early childhood. So it's not like you, you know, going to a country and picking it up and coming back. If you're positive of H. pylori in, on any testing, most likely you got it as a kid or in early childhood. And it has persisted asymptomatically, at least, uh, until you develop symptoms or you incidentally uh, tested positive on, on, uh, on a, uh, for one reason or another. Um, obviously, there's always exception to a rule, but that's sort of the, the current understanding of how uh, you have H. pylori. So why do we care? Well, as I mentioned before, the, you, most, the people who have H. pylori generally already had H. pylori the entire life. And if you look at, sorry, as a population, 80% of these people generally have no symptom. If you look close enough and take samples in your stomach, they probably have a bit of inflammation, inflammation, but it's probably not giving them any trouble. The, the, the reason why we're interested in H. pylori is that about 1% of people develop severe, severe uh, issues with, related to H. pylori. And those things we worry about are gastric cancer and uh, gastric lymphoma, which are uh, directly caused by H. pylori. But clearly, not everybody with H. pylori can develop these serious complications, and that's the part we don't understand completely why. A lot of it has to do with you know, where H. pylori is infecting, what kind of H. pylori it is, and sort of what other environmental and host factors are at play, which is basically shorthand for saying we don't understand. It's still under investigation. But in, sort of in, for our clinic and for sort of the Western society, you know, the, 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 the symptom we're trying to, that we're looking for to treat um, or looking to test H. pylori for is dyspepsia. So these like non-cancerous symptoms of discomfort, uh, fullness, uh, what we call term dyspepsia, is commonly associated with H. pylori as well. And in the hospital, um, having ulcers in the stomach or a small bowel is often commonly associated with H. pylori. So these are the sort of the symptoms that, you know, that is associated with H. pylori infections. And kind of go from the left, the most common, to more alarming to the right. Obviously, my slides did not come out perfectly. My apologies. Um, the middle ones of burning pain in the upper abdomen, pain worse uh, on an empty stomach, nausea, loss of appetite, those are what we call dyspepsia type symptoms. And um, that's probably the most common uh, symptoms in patients who develop issues with H. pylori. Well, on the far right, Symptoms such as unintentional weight loss, severe abdominal pain, uh, black, tarry stool, uh, throwing up black or red blood, those are consistent with uh, cancer or ulcers. So th those are the things that you know, will prompt like an urgent uh, trip to the hospital emergency room. But as I mentioned previously on the previous slide, it's less, very less common. And so 
you know, when we look under the, the endoscopy, so when we take you to do a camera test in the stomach, as I mentioned before, 80% people, if you look by eye, it's probably look, the stomach's gonna look normal. If you look by microscope, generally everybody has a little bit of inflammation, while you know, much smaller percentage, about 20, less than 20% would have either ulcers in the stomach or duodenum, or you know, for the rare, one, rare cases would have uh, cancer, either gastric cancer or malt lymphoma um, present when you take a look. So just to emphasize, the most commonly patients with H. pylori will have normal uh, endoscopy. So uh, H. pylori is, is probably one of the first thing we do when someone presents with these dyspepsia type symptoms, like I mentioned before, fullness, pain, bloating. And the reason we do this is because there's this, there's pretty good data that if you have these symptoms and H. pylori, treatment of the H. pylori will improve the symptoms. Uh, and this is through multiple clinical trials or st studies I've done in the past and through meta-analysis. It's not perfect. It's not like every single person with these symptoms and H. pylori will get better completely with, uh, with treatment. But based on current understanding, the large percentage will. And therefore, we do look for it when these symptoms are present and we can't find any other issues. And uh, we do treat H. pylori whenever we detect it. So because H. pylori is so common, but not common enough that we have to test everyone, there are guidelines who we should test uh, uh, in, in America and uh, essentially any other regions of the world. So in the United States, generally if you have symptoms of dyspepsia, ulcers in the stomach or small bowel, uh, gastric, early gastric cancer, or some rare conditions like idiopathic thrombocytopenia or antibiotic anemia, the current guidelines recommend you would do empiric testing for this bacteria. So if you don't have any symptoms, so you feel well, who should get testing? Well, as I mentioned before, there's a strong vertigo transmission from, par from parents to kids. So if your family member have a proven H. pylori infection, you should get tested. Also, if you have a family history of gastric cancer or ulcers, then you should get tested. Uh, and then also, there's a, there's a the line saying that if you are from an area of um, high prevalence, so you're coming from a country or a region with high uh, prevalence of H. pylori, and you move to the United States, you should be tested as well, even though you're feeling well. And then lastly, if you're somebody who's gonna go on um, long-term NSAID use, like steroid, sorry, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, drug use, then you should be tested because H. pylori will increase your risk of developing ulcers uh, when you're taking uh, NSAIDs long-term. Okay. So how do you test for H. pylori? Well, it's really divided into invasive testing and non-invasive testing. Invasive testing just means like something that it's gonna be uncomfortable versus something that's more comfortable. And invasive testing generally is uh, as part of an uh, endoscopy or like a camera test, scope test of your stomach. And that's generally either, as uh, Barry Marshall and uh, Robert Warren did in the past, taking samples and then staining for the bacteria and looking under the microscope, or other biochemical tests from the pathology sample. Uh, you can also grow it like they did in the past too, but that's much more rare. But since this is in, you know, it's expensive, it is, um, you know, has potential risk of complication, we generally, unless there's a really good reason for uh, doing it, we're gonna use non-invasive testing, so testing that we can do from Quest Lab or any lab um, in the community. And the two main uh, non-invasive testing would be basically testing some, a stool sample or doing a breath test. Uh, they're both very, very good, like they're probably between 95 and 100% in terms of accuracy. Uh, but generally, you know, if the, the, the insurance company or the economic analysis will show that the stool engine testing is generally cheaper than the breath test, and so that's the, probably the, the more common uh, test that's being done uh, currently at this time. Okay. So how do you treat H. pylori? Well, it's actually very, very complicated. So I have not really included every single drug because it would fill up the entire um, slide plus a few more slides. But I'm gonna just talk about the general kind of like points about treatment for H. pylori. The first is that it's probably gonna be for at least 14, probably 14 days. And it's gonna involve at least multiple pills, at least two, probably four pills. Per, uh, and because you're gonna to have to have, take something that's kind of like an NSAID, like either a proton pump inhibitor, 
or bismuth or something called potassium competitive acid blockers. These things kind of decrease the, um, the acid production in the stomach. Uh, bismuth also can uh, have some uh, ability to kill off H. pylori as well. And you need to combine that with antibiotics. And this could either be one antibiotic or even up to three different antibiotics. And that's because uh, there is resistance in H. pylori. And there is generally not one antibiotic can kill all the um, H. pylori out there in North America. And the reason why I'm not very specific about this is because a lot of it depends on where you're living, your uh, penicillin allergy status, and sort of your other comorbidities. But because you know all these, there's so many antibiotics or an acid being taken, it take, treatment for H. pylori is commonly associated with side effects. Uh, at least 30% of developing sort of GI upsets or diarrhea. And generally, when this happens, we recommend you speaking to your gastroenterologist or your prescriber to see what needs to be done. Either do you need to change regimen or do you just push through and, cons and continue? But side effects are commonly um, seen when you're being treated for H. pylori. One of the, one of the key points also is that H. pylori is not easily treated in a lot of cases, and so they really recommend checking afterwards, so a, a month after finishing antibiotics, to check whether the H. pylori is completely um, eradicated, and that's generally through non-invasive testing, such as the breath test we talked about before, or the stool testing. Okay. The, good, the good news is that it's actually really, really hard to catch H. pylori again. So as I mentioned before, you probably caught it as a kid, finally you present as an adult with some sort of symptom, they tested it, you got treated. The chance of you picking up H. pylori again is probably each year is like one, less than 1%. And this is a little bit more if you live in uh, places where there's high prevalence or where there's like less hygiene. But in North America, generally, it's very rare to catch it again. Um, and so, you know, usually one treatment is, is enough for most, for most people. Uh, more commonly, if you develop H. pylori again within the first year or two years after being treated, that's actually not picking up a new uh, strain of H. pylori. It's just that H. pylori got partially treated. It's hiding, and your test was negative, but it just came back after a certain amount of time. Uh, so this is one of the key factors that it's really, really hard to catch H. pylori again. And that kind of goes back to the theme I talked about earlier, that you know, H. pylori seems to be more easily infect younger children as opposed to adults. This is actually a common you know, thing in the, we get in clinics that people ask, like, do we need to keep checking H. pylori? Generally, we don't unless there's a really good reason for it. Okay. okay so I'm just going to summarize my, uh, my talk. Um, really, very f a few key points. So H. pylori is a common stomach bacteria, up to 40 to 50% of the world's population, less than 40% in North America. But that's already a really common bacteria. It's found almost exclusively in the stomach. And it's typically acquired in childhood and persists throughout adulthood. And generally, it's, you know, it's not asymptomatic and you don't really develop any issues with it. But in some um, percentage of patients, you get uh, abdominal symptoms or in worst case scenario, ulcers or cancers uh, due to the H. pylori infection. The good news is that you know, we, it is kind of a more developed story. So we have really good treat, uh, testing and treatment for H. pylori. Although right now, there's no one single pill you can take. Generally, there's multiple a pill, uh, number of pills uh, that you have to take for 14 days. And because of the number of pills, you're going to more, more than likely will develop some sort of GI upsets or other side effects. But uh, generally, most patients are able to complete the course and have it eradicated uh, without too much issue. And the good news is that you likely won't be picking up again in the future. All right, and that's all for me today.